Um, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor David Manlove to our Winter School on Computation and Social Choice and Economics, focus on matching under preferences. David is a professor at University of Glasgow. He doesn't need any introduction among the researchers on matching under preferences. Having written a very well-known and highly cited book entitled Algorithmics of Matchings Under Preferences, it's there on the board, I've already written it down. David's research contributions have significantly led to the growth of the field. Added to that, our, over the years, David has advised or mentored many younger researchers who have gone on to become prominent and impactful researchers of their own standard. I have known David personally for the past few years and can testify to his generosity of spirit with sharing of his ideas and despite his many professional and personal duties, his willingness to spare time. Today, David will talk about kidney exchange. As we have discussed earlier in the school, we all know that it is a problem with enormous social, legal, humanitarian, and uh, seen unseen economic implications. This problem has birthed research, has a, uh, attracted researchers of diverse expertise and today can be truly described as multidisciplinary. David is a theoretical computer scientist and thus his work has focused on mathematical modeling and algorithmics that have practical applications. So without further delay, I welcome Professor David Mandler to our school and invite him to present his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you also to the organizers for the invitation to this very nice winter school. I am sorry that I cannot join you in person, but uh, I'm very happy for the opportunity to be able to present online. So I'm going to talk about algorithms for kidney exchange that have helped to increase opportunities for living kidney donation. And this has been a collaboration with many people and in particular, the National Health Service in the UK. So I'm going to begin with some background to the application. Kidney failure is obviously a very serious illness and it can have two main forms of treatment. Firstly, dialysis, but that can have major lifestyle implications for a patient, typically having to visit their local dialysis unit several times a week. But on the other hand, transplantation has a much better quality of life in the long term for a patient, and it also has much better long term survival prospects compared to dialysis. But obviously, with transplantation, there's a great need for donors. And in the UK, as of 31st of March this year, there were over 5,600 patients on the transplant waiting list waiting for a deceased donor kidney. With the median waiting time for adults being around one year and five months, and around 10 months for children. Now, over a one year period up to 31st of March this year, there were over 3,200 transplants that did take place, but unfortunately demand outstripped supply and there were over 3,400 new patient registrations over that period. Out of those transplants that did take place, over 2,300 were from deceased donors, but 923 were from living donors. Now, many people will know, of course, that adults have two kidneys and can often live with no health or lifestyle implications with just a single kidney. And those living donor transplants accounted for around 28% of all donations over that 12 month period. So many people do have a loved one who would be willing to give them a kidney, but unfortunately, there may be a medical incompatibility that may prevent that. For example, a donor with blood type A cannot normally give a kidney to a recipient with blood type B unless the recipient goes through immunosuppressant therapy. Also, a positive cross match, which is known as a tissue type incompatibility, can also be a reason why a patient might reject a donor kidney. The source of figures on this slide come from the NHS Blood and Transplant Annual Activity Report for Organ Donation and Transplantation. Now, prior to 1st of September 2006 in the UK, there were limitations in place on living kidney donation. In particular, it was only possible for an organ to be donated from a donor to a recipient if there was a genetic attachment or emotional connection between them. In other words, typically a living donor would give an organ to either a spouse, a partner or a blood relative. But following the introduction of the Human Tissue Act, 
There's now the legal framework in place to allow effectively transplants between strangers, provided that there's no financial inducement. And that's led to new possibilities for living donor transplants. For example, through paired kidney donation, a patient who has a willing but incompatible donor can swap their donor with another patient who's in a similar position so that both or all patients can receive a compatible kidney. And through altruistic or non-directed donation, an altruistic donor who's someone who wants to give a kidney but doesn't have an identified recipient can donate directly to the deceased donor waiting list, or DDWL, that's the large waiting list of over 5,600 patients in the UK, for example, waiting for a deceased donor kidney, or they can trigger what are called altruistic donor chains, which I'll illustrate shortly, and they can benefit multiple recipients. So following the introduction of the Human Tissue Act, the UK Living Kidney Sharing Scheme was born, and it's been opera in operation since 2007. And every quarter, a matching run is carried out in which an algorithm is executed in order to find an optimal set of exchanges subject to certain optimality criteria that I'll describe on the set of recipients and donors that's been built up over the intervening period. So I'm going to begin with an example of one of the UK's first pairwise exchanges, which involved a Plymouth and Portsmouth couple in 2007. In Plymouth, there was a father and daughter where the father required a kidney and his daughter was a willing donor, but unable to donate because they had an incompatible blood type. Meanwhile, in Portsmouth, there was a husband and wife pair where the wife required a kidney. Her husband was a willing donor, but this time they had a positive cross match. So what happened? There was a pairwise kidney exchange. So pairwise here means there were two couples where the daughter from the first couple donated one of her kidneys to the wife from the second couple in exchange for her husband donating one of his kidneys to the father from the first couple. So both of these recipients received a kidney, albeit not from their original intending donor. And it should be stressed that neither of these two couples had met one another previously. Now this idea of two couples exchanging donors so the recipients can receive a compatible kidney needn't of course be restricted to two couples. And here's an example of one of the UK's first three-way exchanges, which took place in early December 2009, involving an Aberdonian husband and wife, a Hastings brother and sister, and a St Albans husband and wife. And these arrows here represent the direction of travel of the kidneys. So the Aberdonian husband and wife were operated on in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, and the uh, English-based couples were operated on in London renal transplantation centres. So the top arrow and the bottom left arrow represent kidneys that travelled by plane and the bottom right arrow represents a kidney that travelled across London by ambulance. Now what generally happens with these types of exchanges is that the surgeries are carried out simultaneously to avoid the possibility of a donor reneging after their corresponding recipient has received a kidney. Were that to happen, it could be a really big problem for a recipient whose donor has already donated, uh, but the recipient has not already received a kidney. So for sure the cycle would be broken, but for such a recipient whose donor has already donated and where the recipient hasn't received a kidney, they don't have their donor to take to a future matching run to try to get an alternative match. So to avoid that possibility, these transplants are normally carried out on the same day. And that means three operating theatres for the nephrectomies, three operating theatres for the transplants, six operating theatres and surgical teams that have to be scheduled on the same day. So for logistical reasons, often it's the case that the length of these cycles of exchanges is, tried to, is kept as short as possible. So to illustrate the kinds of structures that are sought as part of the UK LKSS, through paired kidney donation, the matching scheme started off by seeking pairwise or two-way exchanges just involving two couples. And then, as I mentioned uh, shortly after the scheme began, three-way exchanges were also allowed involving three donor-recipient pairs. Now, altruistic donors can trigger chains of transplants that, I'd, that can benefit multiple recipients. So, for example, here's what NHS blood and transplant call a short chain, 
triggered by altruistic donor A1, rather than giving a kidney directly to the deceased donor waiting list and benefiting one recipient, they can trigger a chain that can benefit multiple recipients. So for example, here, A1 is giving a kidney to R2, whose willing but incompatible donor D2 gives a kidney to the deceased donor waiting list. In a long chain, there's one additional donor recipient pair, and the altruistic donor then can benefit three recipients by triggering a chain of this type. So these are all the types of structures that are allowed in the UK Living Kidney Sharing Scheme. Now, in the early stages, when the scheme started, these types of exchanges were quite unusual, certainly in the UK, and they tended to attract some media attention. Here's a BBC News article which focuses on the three-way kidney exchange from December 2009 that I mentioned, where the participants were happy to waive anonymity and to be interviewed. Now, kidney exchange, of course, doesn't just happen in the UK, and focusing first of all on Europe, there are a range of countries that have either national or international kidney exchange programs as illustrated in blue. And there are other countries where kidney exchange is happening either at a regional level or involving single centres of uh, renal transplantation. There are examples as well of international kidney exchange programs where countries are sharing their pools and collaborating in order to give additional opportunities for living kidney donation. The Scandia Transplant Exchange Program involves Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway and Sweden. And this is truly an international collaboration in the sense that these countries don't have their national schemes, but they only collaborate, they only have this international scheme that they belong to. With Italy, Portugal and Spain, this is what's called the KEPSAC collaboration. This is organised in a different way. So these countries have their national matching schemes and then after they optimise nationally, any leftover pairs are then uh, considered as part of the international collaboration so as to give hard to match recipients more opportunities. And there's also an international collaboration involving the Czech Republic, Austria and Israel. Now beyond Europe, there's of course kidney exchange activity. In the US, there are several examples of matching schemes that have a national reach, the Alliance for Paired Kidney Donation, the National Kidney Registry, and the United Network for Organ Sharing, although there's no single national kidney exchange program for the US. And indeed, some of these schemes can, in a sense, be seen as being quite uh, competitive. In Australia, the Australia Paired Kidney Exchange Program started in 2010, and New Zealand joined. So there's now an international collaboration called ANZKX involving Australia and New Zealand. And there's kidney exchange also happening in Canada, in South Korea, and indeed in India, as I'll say a little bit more about in the next slide. As far as the history of kidney exchange is concerned, it was first proposed in 1986, and the first kidney exchange was actually carried out in South Korea in 1991. In, the, in Europe, it was carried out in Switzerland in 1999, in the US in 2000, and in the Netherlands, the first national kidney exchange program was established in 2004, with the UK Living Kidney Sharing Scheme established in 2007. Now, kidney exchange was ruled legal in India in 2011, and very impressively, a 10-way exchange has been carried out in 2020 and was announced in a paper in 2021. So that was a, a, a real accomplishment uh, but was carried out non-simultaneously. So in terms of modelling the problem, let's see how it can be tackled from a computational perspective. So it's convenient to visualise the compatibility involving donors and recipients through a directed graph, where there's a single vertex for each donor-recipient pair. So the directed graph is denoted by D, and it has vertex set V and arc set A. So here we can see in a small example involving three donor recipient pairs, I, J and K. In the directed graph, there's an arc from vertex I to vertex J, if and only if donor I is compatible with recipient J. So we can see that's true here. Donor J is also compatible with recipient I. Donor J is compatible with recipient K. And donor K is compatible with recipient I. So it's easy to see that cycles in the graph correspond to potential exchanges.
And in the UK, as I mentioned, the maximum cycle length that's permitted is three. So therefore, we'll be interested in two cycles and three cycles in particular in this directed graph. But we can also model various things through the use of arc weights. For example, the likelihood of success of the corresponding transplants and also any recipient priority levels that we want to model, such as waiting time or how hard to match they are. In fact, I can describe the weights that's given to each arc in the underlying directed graph. So if we have a single arc from DIRI to DJRJ, then we can illustrate exactly what the constituent components of the scoring scheme are. First of all, we have waiting time. And this prioritizes the recipient RJ that would be the one to receive a kidney through this particular arc. And that's modeled by giving a score of 50 multiplied by the number of previous matching runs that RJ has been unsuccessfully involved in. We then have a component coming from sensitization points, which is in the range 0 to 50, which is essentially a percentage called calculated reaction frequency, which is arrived at through the panel reactive antibody test. And it essentially gives an estimation of how hard to match the recipient RJ is. The harder they are to match, the higher the priority they have in this scoring system. And then we have a component called HLA mismatch points, which looks at the actual donation that would take place between DI and RJ. And it tries to assess how well matched the donor DI is to the recipient RJ. And we do this through human leukocyte antigen mismatch points. We look at the level of tissue types uh, incompatibility between the donor and the recipient. And the larger the tissue type incompatibility, the lower the score in this uh, sliding scale. And then there's a fairness measure. If the donor DI and the donor DJ are closely matched in terms of their age, in other words, their age differs by at most 20 years, then there's a contribution of three points. Otherwise, there's a contribution of zero. And this is just intended to be a fairness component. And there's a final constituent component called a discriminator, which is really just a small addition to try to help with tie breaking. And this looks at the actual donor to donor age difference between DI and DJ, and then normalizes this to a contribution between zero and 0 0.5. So I also mentioned that altruistic donor chains can be considered as part of the UK LKSS. And here's just a, another example to show what UK LKSS refer to as a short chain. So here, altruistic donor A1 is giving a kidney to recipient R3, who has a willing but incompatible donor D3, in exchange for D3 giving a kidney to the deceased donor waiting list. Now we can model this in the same way as a pairwise exchange, by just thinking of a dummy recipient for the altruistic donor A1. Let's call that dummy recipient R1. And that dummy recipient is then automatically compatible for every non-altruistic donor. So with that in mind, we can think of short chains as cycles of length two. And we can think of long chains as in the right-hand diagram in terms of three cycles. And this is how the transformation would look in the directed graph as illustrated on the previous slide. So this is the altruistic donor A1, who is compatible with recipient R3, and this is the altruistic donor A2, who is compatible with recipient R4. And then we add these dummy arcs, going from non-altruistic donors back to the implicit dummy recipient of the altruistic donors. And that means that we can continue to search for two cycles and three cycles as before, uh, we need, all we need to do is to make sure that at most one selected altruistic donor appears per cycle. And this means that we can then search for short chains and long chains, as well as searching for two cycles and three cycles. So a key question in kidney exchange programs is what we should optimize. And this is not always an easy question to answer. So let's have a look at this directed graph here, which is intended to be just a small example of a compatibility graph. And what we might do to start off with is select this three cycle, which of course would give us a three way exchange. And this would be what we would call a maximal solution in the sense that we cannot add another cycle to this partial solution without violating the property that each vertex must be incident to at most one selected cycle. That has to be the case because each donor is of course donating at most one kidney and each recipient is receiving at most one kidney. So what we're really looking for is a vertex disjoint cycle packing. 
and this would be a maximal solution with respect to that property. So we achieve three transplants through that three cycle. But of course, it's possible to achieve five transplants if we choose instead the two cycle at the bottom left and the three cycle involving uh, vertices two, five and four. So it seems as though maximizing the number of transplants would be an obvious objective. But it's not always as simple as that if we consider the weights that might occur in the arcs. So, for example, the solution with three transplants might have a total weight of 250 if we add up the weights of the constituent arcs. But then it might be the case that the weights on every other arc might be also five, in which case the solution with five transplants has a total weight of 25. So then we have a difficult question as to whether to choose a solution with a lower number of transplants, which either gives transplants with a higher chance of success or benefits higher priority patients, or else choose a solution with a higher number of transplants, but with a lower chance of success. So these are difficult questions, which are normally settled by the clinical policy makers. And all, all really the uh, computer scientists have to do is to try to ensure that algorithms are then designed that meet the criteria that are agreed upon by the kidney advisory specialists. Now, it's normally the case in many kidney exchange programs that there are dual objectives. And the first objective is to maximize the number of transplants. And then subject to this, we maximize the overall score. So let's now define the optimization problem formally. So in the basic optimization problem, we define a set of exchanges to be a packing of vertex disjoint cycles in our directed graph where we say that a vertex V is covered by this packing if it's incident to a cycle in the packing. So essentially that would mean that a vertex is going to take part in a, a cycle or a chain. And then we define the set of exchanges to be optimal if we maximize the number of vertices covered by the packing, which will therefore maximize the number of transplants. And then subject to that, we maximize the sum of the weights in the selected arcs, and that will maximize the total score. Now, a key restriction uh, of the problem is gained when we consider limits on the lengths of the cycles and chains. In the first case that we consider, we look at only two cycles, in other words, pairwise exchanges. In the second restriction, we don't place any upper limit on the maximum length of cycle and also chain. And in the third case, we place an upper limit of three on the maximum length of cycles and implicitly chains as well. So let's look at each of these special cases separately. In the first case, we're only going to allow pairwise exchanges and by implication short chains as well. And it turns out that this restriction can be solved in polynomial time by the use of graph matching. What we do is we transform the directed graph D into an undirected graph G. So let's see how the transformation works. We've got the directed graph D on the left-hand side, given as an example. And what we're going to do is to transform it to the, direct, the undirected graph G on the right-hand side, which has exactly the same vertex set. Now, every, every time we have a two cycle in our directed graph D, we're going to replace that with an undirected edge in G. And what that allows us to do is then choose a maximum cardinality matching of maximum weight in our undirected graph G. And if we do this, we can map this back to the corresponding set of two cycles, which of course will then be vertex disjoint. We can ensure that the weight of the matching is preserved by giving the weight of an undirected edge the sum of the weights of the corresponding directed arcs that uh, appear in the directed graph D. And that will ensure that if we find a maximum weight, maximum cardinality matching in G, it then gives us an optimal solution in D, a maximum weight, maximum cardinality matching. And of course, the matching that we need, which is the maximum weight, maximum cardinality matching in the undirected graph, can be found in polynomial time using, for example, Gavau and Tarjan's algorithm from 1991. So at least in the case where we seek only pairwise exchanges and short chains, the problem is solvable in polynomial time. And many countries, such as France, do consider only pairwise exchanges. So at least in this case, there is an efficient algorithm to find an optimal solution. Now, you've heard, I think, about the stable roommates problem earlier on in the winter school. 
and it can be useful to look at a connection between kidney exchange and stable roommates. Instead of considering cardinal weights on the ARCs, we can think of ordinal preferences for recipients that take into account the suitability of a donor kidney for a recipient. And this would let us view the problem by means of this kind of direct, undirected graph structure. So here we can see again a vertex for each donor recipient pair and an undirected edge corresponding to mutual compatibility. So for example, this middle edge here represents the fact that D1 is compatible with R4 and D4 is compatible with R1. So that's a potential pairwise exchange. Remember, we're just restricting attention to pairwise exchanges at the moment. And what we can do is to model the compatibility levels through the use of ordinal preferences. So for example, R1's first choice and best donor could be D2, R1's second choice and second best donor could be D5, and so on. And with ordinal preferences in this undirected graph representation, we can then consider the stable roommates problem as a possible model. And this was suggested by Rolf Sundmetz in 2005, and a stable matching could therefore be a potential solution criterion. It should be mentioned, however, that although this is a, a suitable model in theory, I'm not aware of any practical example of where stable matchings are considered in real world kidney exchange programs. So let's now move on to the case where the exchanges are unrestricted in length. And this then also gives us an example of a polynomial time solvable special case. So in this case, then we're going to transform again the directed graph to an undirected graph, but this time the undirected graph is bipartite. So the transformation is slightly different. We uncouple each donor recipient pair into separate vertices this time. So if we have originally donor recipient pair DIRI in the directed graph D, in our undirected graph G, we're going to have a separate vertex for donor I and a separate vertex for recipient I. And all the donor vertices are going to be one color class in the bipartition, and the recipient vertices are going to be the other set in the bipartition. And we'll have an edge between the donor and the recipient with the same index with a weight of zero. And the other edges essentially correspond to compatibility in the directed graph. So for example, if there's an edge from DI to RJ, we'll have the corresponding edge in the undirected graph. What we then have is a set of exchanges in D corresponding to a perfect matching in G with the same weight. And given that we can find a maximum weight perfect matching in a bipartite graph in polynomial time, then again, we can solve this variant efficiently in the directed graph. Let's just see how a full transformation would work for this small instance here. We're given this directed graph D then the bipartite graph will have five donor vertices and five recipient vertices corresponding to the five donor recipient pairs. We have these five vertical edges of weight zero. And if we look at this arc here, which goes from donor one to recipient two and it has weight three, then this is the corresponding edge in the bipartite graph, which would have the same weight in G. Now, if we have a look at a maximum weight perfect matching in G, then this will give us a maximum weight unrestricted length set of exchanges. So to give an example of how we would recover this, start, for example, from vertex one corresponding to donor one, and it's matched to recipient four. So donor one gives to recipient four, and then we go up to donor four who gives a kidney to recipient five, and then donor five gives a kidney to recipient two, and then donor two gives a kidney to recipient one, and we're back to where we started. And that corresponds to this four-way exchange in the directed graph D. And we can see that in G, the vertical edge between donor three and recipient three was selected, meaning that because that's a, a zero weight edge that was selected, donor recipient three does not participate in any cycle. So this is an example of a solution with maximum weight, but we can see that it involves a long cycle, and that can often be the case when we don't place a restriction on the maximum length of cycles. So generally speaking, it is important to have an upper bound on the maximum length of a cycle in force in a practical kidney exchange program. And in many cases, that upper bound is three, as in the UK, or four, as in the Netherlands, for example, or it could be larger. But unfortunately, 
when we do have a fixed upper bound on the maximum cycle length, which is greater than or equal to 3, then the problem turns out to be NP hard, as was first shown by Abraham et al. in 2007. So, of course, the NP hardness of the problem means that any algorithm is going to be doomed to run in exponential time in the worst case if it solves the problem optimally. So this may lead us to consider maybe heuristics or approximation algorithms, but they're not generally seen as acceptable. It's generally preferred to find optimal solutions. So then because of the exponential nature of exact algorithms in the worst case, techniques are then important to try to speed up this uh, type of algorithm. And integer programming is often used as a common solution technique in practical kidney exchange programs. So in case you haven't seen integer programming before, I'm going to give a short introduction to integer programming, and then I'm going to illustrate how it can be used in order to solve the kidney exchange problem. So integer programming typically involves optimizing some objective function subject to satisfying constraints that are given in the form of linear inequalities. So the general integer programming problem has the following form. We maximize some objective function, which is given by C transpose X, subject to constraints, which are given by AX less than or equal to B. And essentially the decision variables that we have to compute values for are in the vector X. So here C is an N long, N long vector of coefficients. X is our N length vector of variables. B is our M length vector of bounds. And A is an M times N matrix consisting of coefficients that essentially represents our constraints. Now linear programming is the relaxation of integer programming in which the variables Xi can be continuous and in that case, the problem actually turns out to be solvable in polynomial time. But the polynomial time algorithms are actually not generally used in linear programming solvers. They're generally based on the simplex algorithm, which is an exponential time algorithm in the worst case, but does tend to behave um, more efficiently in practice than the polynomial time algorithms. On the other hand, the integer programming problem in general is NP hard, but there are some powerful solvers such as Cplex and Gorobi and also some very useful and important uh, open source solvers that can help us to solve even moderately large sized uh, instances of a problem quite quickly in reality. So this means that the NP hardness of the problem need not prevent us from tackling practical instances in reality. Let's have a look at how to model an NP hard problem using integer programming. I'm going to choose the knapsack problem, which many of you will have heard of. An instance of this problem involves n items. Each item has a weight wi and a profit pi and a knapsack capacity c. And what we seek essentially is a subset of the indices 1 to n such that if we add together the items that are chosen according to these indices, then we don't exceed the knapsack capacity. And we do this so as to maximize the summation of the profits corresponding to the selected items from this subset. So in other words, what we want to do is to choose some subcollection of the items so as to maximize the total profit without exceeding the knapsack capacity. And this problem is NP hard in general. If we see a small example with a knapsack of capacity 65 and five items, then these are the weights and the profits of the items. And of course, if we choose all the items, then we will overshoot the knapsack capacity by a long way. So we can't just choose all the items, of course. If we choose items one and four, then the total weight is 56. That's 23 plus 33. And the total profit is 68, 33 plus 35. But if we choose items two, three, and four, then the total weight of the items, again, is no more than the knapsack capacity. That's 23 plus 11 plus 35. And the total profit is 69, 15 plus 15 plus 33. And I'm sorry, uh, 23 plus 11 plus 35. So that gives a total profit of 69, which is optimal. It turns out that we can't do any better than that. So let's now see how to model the knapsack problem using integer programming. Well, essentially for every item, we have a single choice of whether to take the item or whether to leave it behind. 
So we model these choices through binary decision variables x1 up to xn, where xi is 1 if item i is selected and 0 otherwise. And then we define the following integer programming model, where we maximize the summation of pi times xi, which is our objective function. So this basically maximizes the sum of the profits for all the selected items. Every time xi is 1, then we have a contribution of pi. And then the single constraint just says that the knapsack capacity cannot be exceeded by summing together the wi weights corresponding to the items that are selected, and that must be less than or equal to c. And the final constraint just says that the xi must be binary valued. So this is a very simple example of an integer programming formulation. And now we can lead on to talk about an integer programming formulation for kidney exchange. So the classical cycle formulation is a well-used kidney exchange formulation for integer programming that was first described by Roth, Sundmetz and Unver in 2007. And it was first investigated computationally by Abraham et al. And what it involves is creating variables for the feasible cycles that are allowed in the directed graph. So if we assume that we're allowing only two cycles and three cycles, then we list them all and let's assume that they are C1 up to CM and they can be found, for example, using depth first search. And we have binary valued variables X1 up to XM, where essentially each XI corresponds to cycle CI and it represents again the decision that we're taking as to whether to select CI or whether to not select it. But we also have to enforce the constraint that each variable corresponding, each vertex corresponding to a donor recipient pair is incident to at most one selected cycle. So we build an n times m constraint matrix A, where n is the number of vertices and m is the number of two cycles and three cycles in total, whose i comma j value is equal to one, if and only if vertex vi is incident to cycle cj. And then we have this vector of dimensions n times one, which just comprises ones, and that's used to enforce the upper bound that each vertex must be incident to at most one selected cycle. And then we have this cost vector, which is essentially a vector of values corresponding to whatever we want to optimize. If the jth member of that cost vector is the length of the jth cycle, then that would give us the number of transplants associated with each selected cycle, and we could use this to maximize the number of transplants. So what we then solve is maximizing c times x subject to ax less than or equal to b, where the xi are binary valued. Let's see an example of this with respect to this directed graph shown at the top with five donor recipient pairs. Now, it turns out that there are seven two cycles and three cycles in total. The first four are two cycles and the last three are three cycles. If we look at cycle c1, it involves donor recipient pairs one and two, and that's why we have a one in rows one and two of column one of the constraint matrix. Cycle C2 involves donor recipient pairs one and three. Cycle C3 involves donor recipient pairs two and five. C4 involves four and five, and those are all the two cycles. If we then look at the three cycles, C5 is a three cycle involving vertices one, four, and two. So it in fact goes in this direction here. Cycle C6 is a three cycle involving one, four, and three. So it goes in this direction. And finally, C7 involves vertices two, five, and four. Um, we can see the direction of the arcs here. So those are all the two cycles and three cycles. We then have a five times one vector of ones corresponding to the vertices being incident to at most one two cycle or three cycle that's selected in the solution. And we have our seven times one vector of variables corresponding to the decisions that we're making on all the cycles. We then have our vector of costs. So the cost of each two cycle is two and the cost of each three cycle is three if we want to maximize the number of transplants. And then an optimal solution would select cycles C2 and C7. And if that's the case, then we have a two cycle involving donor recipient pairs one and three, and a three cycle involving donor recipient pairs two, five, and four. And we can see that that then gives us five transplants, which obviously must be optimal. So this is a very basic cycle formulation 
that gives us uh, a solution for maximizing the number of transplants. But in general, we need to consider extensions that are important in practical matching schemes. For example, in the UK, what's important is to mitigate the risk of three-way exchanges. So three-way exchanges are in general more risky than pairwise exchanges because three ways involve six people and it takes just one person to become ill for the whole cycle to collapse. So if we're able to minimize the number of three-way exchanges whilst maintaining the number of transplants, then this would be seen as advantageous. For example, we could find six transplants in two different ways, either through three pairwise exchanges or two three-way exchanges. And so the solution on the left would be preferred because it involves no three-way exchanges. If we do have to select three-way exchanges, we would like to prioritize what are called back arcs. So back arcs are arcs in the opposite direction to the direction of the cycle itself. And here's an example of a back arc from D3R3 to D2R2, which is in the opposite direction to the three-way exchange that it belongs to. Now back arcs are useful because, as in this case, they could give an embedded pairwise exchange. This means that if either D1 or R1 were to become ill, after the, uh, after the tree cycle has been identified, then the embedded pairwise exchange could still proceed. So instead of us losing three transplants, we lose only one, and we're still able to salvage a pairwise exchange from the failed three-way exchange. So this gives us some kind of backup op option or fault tolerance that mitigates the risk associated with three-way exchanges. There are other recourse options that are also possible in the UK LKSS. For example, it might be the case that a recipient has multiple willing donors. As in this example, it might be that both D2 and D4 happen to be compatible with R1. And if D2 were to become ill, for example, then D4 could participate in a pairwise exchange instead. And the same thing, of course, could happen in a three-way exchange where D2 could be swapped out for D4 if D2 were to become ill after the three-way exchange has been identified, and this could allow the three-way exchange to continue. And this idea of swapping out donors could also happen at the end of a chain, where this is a short chain, and if donor D1 were to become ill and recipient R1 has an alternative donor, then it's very likely that this alternative donor D5 could give a kidney to a recipient on a deceased donor waiting list because there are over 5,000 such recipients and an excellent chance that there would be a good match for D5. And of course, this could happen at the end of a long chain as well, or indeed in the middle of a long chain, as shown here, provided that these two donors are compatible with recipient R2. Now, recourse options are also possible in other ways, not just through alternative donors. And this is an example, again, of a three-way exchange with an embedded two-way exchange, which I showed earlier. But we can also have embedded arcs that occur within other types of structures. So, for example, here's a long chain with an embedded pairwise exchange. If it were the case that D2 were compatible with R1, then if, for example, the altruistic donor were to become ill, then instead of proceeding with a long chain, we could instead have this embedded pairwise exchange. Here we can see an example of where a long chain fails, but we're able to salvage two embedded short chains. So in this first example, it might be the case that donor D2 becomes ill and is not able to donate to the deceased donor waiting list, but D1 could donate instead. Or in this third example, we can see that if D1 were to become ill, and the altruistic donor happens to be compatible with R2 as well as R1, then we can have a short chain triggered by the altruistic donor donating directly to R2 instead. So I'm now going to specify what the optimization problem is in the UK. So it involves these different types of risk mitigations, and it involves essentially five optimality criteria that need to be optimized lexicographically. So again, we define a set of exchanges to be a vertex disjoint cycle packing, but this time each cycle has to have length at most three. And we define a set of exchanges to be optimal if, first of all, the number of effective pairwise exchanges is maximized. So this is the first condition. Uh, what's an effective pairwise exchange? It's either a pairwise exchange itself or it's a three-way exchange that contains a back arc.
The second objective says that subject to the first objective, we must maximise the number of vertices that are covered, in other words, maximise the number of transplants. The third objective says that subject to the first two objectives, we must minimise the number of three-way exchanges. The fourth objective says that subject to the first three objectives, we should maximise the number of back arcs in the selected three-way exchanges. And finally, the fifth objective says that subject to the first four objectives, we should maximise the total weight. So these are the objectives which are optimised consecutively or hierarchically in a lexicographic fashion in the UK. Here's a visualisation of the compatibility graph that came from the July 2015 data set with over 200 donor recipient pairs. So what we see here is vertices corresponding to donor recipient pairs and altruistic donors. So for example, we have cycles. So this is a, an optimal solution that has been dragged out to the outer edges of the graph. We can see two cycles corresponding to pairwise exchanges and three cycles corresponding to three-way exchanges. And this is an example of a chain that's triggered by an altruistic donor. These two blue vertices at the left are unused altruistic donors who will donate directly to the deceased donor waiting list. And these pink vertices in the middle are unused or unmatched donor recipient pairs who will then continue to the next matching run. So the point is that in a, an example as large as this, there are literally hundreds of millions of different combinations of potential cycle packings. And the integer programming formulation has obviously got to pick out an optimal solution from within this huge search space. So to give some figures, since the scheme began, there's been over 2,900 transplants that have been identified. Now, unfortunately, not all of the identified transplants lead to surgery, and there are many reasons for this. For example, laboratory cross-matching can identify tissue type incompatibilities that were not predicted through virtual cross-matching, and also donors and recipients can become ill after they've been identified for transplants before the surgery can take place. However, the UK has a cumulative conversion rate of around 65% of actual transplants to identified transplants, which is very impressive and something that I take absolutely no credit for. If we look at the transplants that have taken place, it can be split up into the different types of exchanges as shown. So just under 200 pairwise exchanges, just over 200 three-way exchanges, under 200 short chains and 150 long chains. Now there are another, a couple of things that are worth mentioning that are important in kidney exchange programs. For example, strategic issues may occur. So hospitals might withhold their easiest to match pairs and report only their hardest to match pairs to the national program. And this is illustrated through this diagram here. So in this very small example, there are three hospitals, H1, H2, and H3. Hospital H1 has two pairs, donor recipient pairs A and B. Hospital H2 has one pair C, and H3 has one pair D. Now, if we were to consider a national matching scheme involving all three hospitals, in which all of the hospitals behave truthfully and report all of their pairs, then we may want to maximise the number of transplants. In this case, a solution with the maximum number of transplants would choose the cycle involving A, C and D, which would give us three transplants. But if we have a look at the solution from H1's point of view, only one of H1's patients has been transplanted, and they may feel that they could do better by restricting attention to their pairs in-house. And they may instead just try to find an optimal solution involving their own pairs, A and B. And if they do this, then they could match both of their patients through this pairwise exchange. So that might then lead them to believe that they should withhold their pairs from the national scheme and instead just report their hardest to match pairs, the leftover pairs, to a national scheme. In this case, what would happen is that there would be no further transplants that would be possible and donors, uh, recipient pairs C and D would therefore be unmatched. So clearly, if a hospital were to behave in a strategic manner and withhold some of its pairs, it could harm recipients and other hospitals who would lose out on transplants they may otherwise have obtained. 
So what we need to do is to form strategy proof mechanisms to incentivize hospitals to report all of their pairs to a national scheme. Luckily, this isn't an issue in the UK because the UK LKSS started as a national scheme and has continued as such. What I also want to mention are NEAD chains, non-simultaneous extended altruistic donor chains, and these can involve donor patient pairs triggered by an altruistic donor. And instead of the final donor donating a kidney to a deceased donor waiting list, they essentially are held over to the next matching run where they play the role of an altruistic donor and they can trigger another chain. And then the final donor from that chain segment can then be held over as a bridge donor and can continue. Now, of course, the chain segments don't have to have the same length and they can continue indefinitely in theory. And indeed, in the US, there have been really long NEAD chains. Sometimes they're called never ending altruistic donor chains. And there's been chains of length more than 90 that have stretched over a period of months and indeed years. So this is an important development which could be potentially introduced in the future in the UK. So to finish with some future work, what we would like to do is to continue to develop the algorithms so that they can meet the needs of the UK optimality criteria, which are at the moment quite specific to the UK, uh, whilst at the same time allowing for longer chains, which might arise, for example, through NEAD chains. But longer chains can also arise through the fact that the surgeries associated with these chains don't necessarily have to be done simultaneously. There's less risk associated with chains compared to cycles because all we need to do is to make sure that a donor does not donate until their corresponding patient has received a kidney. So, for example, here we could see that even if patient P2 receives a kidney and D2 then becomes ill and therefore cannot donate, then it's not a disaster for P3 because although P3, of course, has not then received a kidney from D2, they still have their willing donor D3 who has not yet donated, and therefore they can go forward to the next matching run, and they could be matched in an alternative chain or cycle. And we can then ensure that there's an alternative for them. So for this reason, with less risk associated with chains, they can be done non-simultaneously, and therefore they can be longer. So it's important that algorithms can then scale up to allow for longer chains and indeed a larger number of altruistic donors as well. Also, larger pools may arise from international collaboration. So that means pools of countries that are merging their donor recipient data sets in order to join forces and to increase the opportunities, particularly for hard to match patients. And that, of course, can give rise to larger problem instances, which can be increasingly challenging for algorithms. Also, when we're considering multi-country collaboration, we have to have some kind of consensus about exactly what to optimize. And that could be different from the country's existing practice. So we need to ensure that the algorithms can be capable of finding solutions with respect to different types of optimality objectives. And again, with respect to fairness and stability, it's really important to ensure these properties when we're considering international collaboration. That means that countries are incentivized to participate because they can ensure that they're going to get out as much as they put in. Otherwise, they may prefer just to operate their own national matching schemes. So again, this is ongoing work that has just started as part of our Kidney Algo project, which is supported by EPSRC. So I'd like to acknowledge funding from the EPSRC, as well as from COST, which has supported the European research networks that I've been involved in. I'd also like to acknowledge support uh, and the collaboration from colleagues at NHS Blood and Transplant. And I'd like to finish by thanking you all for your attention, and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Can you hear me? Yes, I Thank can hear you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David, for the wonderful talk. Learned so much of details about the background logistics and the imperatives behind this.
sort of uh, this problem. So I just had a few some basic questions. For instance, when we model, as far as the modeling is concerned, and when we add the edge weight to determine potential uh, donor pairs, the point, uh, the question is like, you take into consideration biological incompatibilities and this test results and so on and so forth. What about the physical distance between donors uh, and potential recipients? For example, in a country like this, as like India, as big as India is, and certain parts being hard to reach, is that something that comes into play that in order for the transplant, for the exchanges to go forward successfully, people have to be some, you know, placed somewhere reasonably close so that uh, sort of this transportation of the organs and so on and so forth can happen seamlessly? Yes, I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, that certainly is a, a challenging issue for actually conducting these exchanges in practice. So there are essentially two uh, possibilities here. Either the kidneys travel or the donors and recipients travel. So um, what's preferred, at least in the UK, for example, is that the kidneys will travel. And this is to allow the donors and recipients to be operated on as close to home as possible in order to aid their recovery. Uh, but uh, of course, there have to be cases and there have been cases previously where donors and recipients can travel uh, in order to essentially be near to one another. And that can obviously aid the, the shipment of the kidneys and make that part of the operation um, simpler. Um, at least in the UK, the called ischemia time, which is the time that the kidney is outside of the body, is generally long enough to allow for the kidneys to be transported across the UK. And in fact, if we look at the Australia-New Zealand kidney exchange program, this is an interesting example of where there have even been the shipment of kidneys between Perth and Auckland. So the west western part of Australia to New Zealand, which really is a six hour plane journey, I think, and uh, still it's been possible for the patients to be operated on uh, at their own local transplantation centers. Uh, one other question, or maybe one, two other questions. So the issue of incentive compatibility. So, uh, I mean, we know that in game theory, at least designing a strategy proof mechanism is really hard, sometimes impossible. So is there any reason to believe that there could be an incentive, um, sort of a strategy proof mechanism or the incentives of the hospitals to report truthfully can really be aligned with what is socially good, as in as many transplant exchanges happen as possible. Yeah, I mean, it might be possible to show that uh, we can't necessarily achieve the maximum possible number of transplants through such incentive compatible mechanisms. But it may be that through simulations, we can show that uh, these incentive compatible mechanisms can do quite well. Um, there have been some credit uh, based mechanisms that have been proposed that, for example, allow a country to do a little bit worse at one matching run, provided that its target is then increased and therefore it can be balanced for the next matching run. So that what we look at is that overall, over a longer period of time, the, the countries should be faring as equally as possible. So these credit based systems seem to be quite uh, uh, a, a, a good way to to ensure that uh, there's fairness and stability among the participating countries. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much.